Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the session. And in this talk, I want to introduce our effort for migrating the high workload to Spark, and our effort to the slides. Sorry, excuse me. Thank you. I want to cover the, our effort to migrate the high workload to Spark and our, um, what's the challenge we hit and how do we solve it to narrow down the gap between the Hive and the Spark. First, I introduce myself. Uh, my name is Zhang Zhang, software engineer in Facebook. And Jane Wang uh, is my colleague and we collaborate on this project in the Spark Big Compute team. Um, actually, in one and a half year ago, we started uh, initiated this project to do the Hive to Spark uh, migration. And why we want to do this um, is to make the big, yes, first, uh, I forgot the, inter the overview of my topic. The first one is the effort. Next uh, is our effort to uh, narrow down the feature gap. Then we will go through the performance and the reliability improvement for Spark and in production. The last one, we introduce some advanced optimization for extremely large job. Why we want to make the uh, migration work? There are two major reasons. One is in Facebook, Hive is uh, one of the major batch computer engine, and the workload uh, actually triple or double or triple every year. And it's a big resource, uh, one of the biggest uh, cluster in our Facebook. We want to reduce the resource usage. And Spark as a more advanced uh, computation engine, and the performance-wise is much better. And also, it gives the user more flexibility to write their own um, application logic. To save the resource is the basic initiative, initiative to do the migration. The second one is if we want to switch to the more advanced computation engine, for example, Spark or Presto, we want the data engineer, they don't need to learn a lot of new stuff. They can write the pipeline in the old way, for example, Hive. Then we want to find, identify and improve the feature gap between the Hive and the Spark. Initially, as a first step, we want to find how compatible between the Hive and Spark. We do the syntax analysis. As we find about 50% of Hive workload can migrate to Spark without any change. But this number is not high. We further look into it. We find if the top time feature gap, we can fix those top time feature gap, actually the compatibility can be improved to about 90%. This is, number is very good and encouraging because the, we only fix uh, time, maybe time feature gap, we got a good cover. In Facebook, we have a lot of table. Actually, it, it has uh, maybe hundreds of columns because the data is huge. And when the data engineer writes their data pipeline, we don't want to specify each column. Typically. In production, we find a lot of SQL is written like this. Select all the column except uh, some column. But uh, in Spark, we don't have this feature support. If we want to migrate this uh, uh, workload from the Hive to Spark, either we have to rewrite the SQL to specify every column. This uh, is impossible because we have so many legacy pipeline. The second one is we added the feature support for the regex column specification. 
uh, my colleague Jian Wang uh, implemented this feature, and also this code already committed to the upstream. The second one is the local file system writes. When the data engineer writing their pipeline, they want to do maybe some testing or some inspection of the data. So this, this in production may be not used a lot, but uh, during the development is uh, used a lot. So we also improve, um, implement this feature and uh, commit it to upstream. The other major challenge one is the UDF support. We have so many proprietary UDFs. Because the Hive and the Spark, there is some architecture level difference. Those, um, most of UDF may be supported well, but uh, they, it does have some UDF. For example, uh, we have the UDF, UDTF, and UDF Java function. Those function is uh, similar to the Lambda function. The user can write arbitrary Java code inside of the um, UDF. We find in our production, actually, sometimes it has hundreds, even thousands Java code. It may be not a good uh, engineering practice, but we have so many engineers, we have to support this feature. But in Spark, it has the driver and the executor. Those UDF, uh, part of it e is evaluated on the driver side. We have to sterilize and desterilize to the uh, executor side. During this process, we hit a lot of issue. For example, um, main, mainly the sterilization issue. Those fix are straightforward, but uh, to identify the root cause is uh, very difficult. The phase itself may be just change some field um, to the transient field. But uh, we have so many UDF, we pick up the major one, um, pop, is very popular in some namespace usage. After fixing those major feature gaps, we improve our uh, compatibility from a little bit more than 50% to 85%. But uh, there is still about 14% uh, those jobs cannot migrate to Spark directly. But for those 14%, there is some false positive. For example, there may be sequentially some pipeline. The first pipeline writes some table to the temporary, writes some data to the temporary table, then the following pipeline use those temporary table. When we do the offline shadowing, uh, those table is not available, causing those sun table, not, table missing syntax failure. Uh, if you want to see our migration framework, probably you can, uh, you can take a look at uh, my last year's presentation that has uh, all the detail for the migration framework. With those improvements, we got uh, a very big good progress for our work workload migration. In half a year, our workload in Spark in grows 3x. Here, the red line is the reservation CPU, and the blue line is the CPU. The reservation C the reserve CPU here, the concept is when the Spark job requests the resource from the underlying resource manager, for example, the Yang for the open source, they request this resource, but uh, it may not run in any task on those uh, node manager. Because um, maybe it's blocking an I.O., or it's because the scheduling overhead on the driver. But uh, this resource cannot be used by any other job. It's got wasted. The second one is the CPU uh, usage. This is the real um, resource usage running, uh, that is running on the task. In the, you can see the gap between the blue line and the red line is uh, actually very big. Sometimes it's about 1.5 to 1.6 um, multiplier. Most of them actually is uh, the blocking I.O. With those feature gap uh, um, improvement, next, when we run those pipeline, we all, the major initiative is to get the good performance in Spark. But the reality is uh, sometimes it's not like that. Um, especially for join. Actually, for the small job, the job may be OK. But in our uh, workload, the join, um, sometimes is very, the data size is very big. We have three major join strategy. One is the broadcast join, shuffle hash join, and uh, the last one is the sortment join. 
In the broadcast join, typically, for example, A join B, if we assume B is very small and we can fit it into memory, the best way is uh, um, build the hash map, broadcast the table B on every executor, then build the hash map for the table B. Then on the table A, we stream in the table A, then do the matchup for each row on the hash map, then I mean the uh, matching result. In this case, we don't have the shuffle, also we don't have the sorting. It's very efficient. In the shuffle hash join, in the similar case, we have the A and the B, A join B. B is, uh, is small, but it's not, not uh, small enough to fit into the memory. Each split, when we do the join, we have the partition, partition B. Each partition of B is small enough, can fit into memory. In this case, the reducer, after it fetch, uh, it fetch in the each partition, then build the hash map on each partition of B. Then do the match and the hashing lookup on each row of table A, then emit the results. In this case, we have the shuffle, but we don't need the sort. The third one is the sort merge join. In this case, both A and B is big. Even each partition, they cannot fit into, into memory. We have to do the shuffling, then the sorting. Mm, it's very straightforward. This is the most uh, heavy one. So comparing these two, these three cases, broadcast is most efficient. Shuffle has joined in the middle. And, uh, but the problem is, they, for broadcast join and the shuffle hash join, they are not uh, reliable, for especially when the data estimation is uh, not correct. In the runtime, we may hit the out of memory issue. In Spark, the out of memory issue, especially for broadcast join and shuffle hash join, is not recoverable. If we have the data, most of the days, the data can, we can use the hash join, but someday, the same pipeline, the data may be big in some day. In 10 days, 90 days, we can use the hash join. But only one day, that bit data is big. We cannot use the hash join because the uh, out of memory issue. In production, this is very serious. We would rather choose the reliability instead of the performance. But when we choose the reliability, we don't have those uh, optimization. So we implement a new operator is a dynamic join. In this dynamic join, we based on the stats to choose the join strategy. For example, if we choose the hash join, but when we do the, uh, in the runtime, if the, when we build the hash, top, hash map on the partition of each table, uh, each partition of table A, sometimes if the d data cannot fit into memory, regular cases the job will fail. But here we catch the outer memory exception. Here the outer memory is the Java mem uh, is a Spark memory management outer memory. It's not JVM. Um, JVM um is not recoverable. If we hit the Spark outer memory, we reconstruct the iterator, then do the regular sort merge join. The actual overhead here we say is uh, if we fall back to the sort merge join, the hashing build up phase is got wasted but it improve our reliability in our production. Um, with this fallback mechanism, actually we can leverage more aggressively with the shuffle hash join. Here is uh, the physical plan for our join oper um, dynamic join operator. The, in the middle is a dynamic join. It's, you can think it's about the Combination of the shuffle hash join and the sort merge join is a fallback mechanism. The other case is the bucket join. In the bucket join, in, on the left side, A join B, typically we have the same number of buckets. Then each bucket join with each other. Then we don't have the shuffle, also we don't have the sort. It's a very efficient one and used a lot in our production. But in, Actually, my colleague uh, teachers did a lot of work on this part. Um, on the right side, here we also have A join B. But A and B have different number of buckets. A have four buckets, B have two buckets. Typically, uh, in high, we can, if the number of buckets of A is multiplied of the buckets of B, 
Actually, we don't need the shuffle. In Spark, we also implemented this feature. On the right side, we combine bucket one and bucket three in table A, then join with bucket one in table B. So we skip the shuffle case. Because uh, we also use the hash join a lot. We leverage hash join a lot. So we also don't need the sorting for this case. And before we have this feature, we have to do shuffling. Um, the real production workload actually running similar or even worse in Spark. But after this feature implemented, um, we see 2x or 3x improvement over Hive. It's, a, it's a one of the major workloads in our production. The next phase is when we do the migration, we, for small job, probably we can't have the fixed configuration. But for extremely large job, here is the example. We have 10,000 mapper, 10,000 reducer. It's a two-phase two job. It's, simpler, it's much simpler than our real production job. It, in production job, for those large jobs, we may have multiple stage. Each stage may have tons of thousands of tasks. Then we have hit a lot of issues. The first one is the, the IOPS. We use the HDD disk. It has the mechanical, uh, we have to move the head. If we read and write a very small amount of data, the IOPS itself is the bottleneck. As I mentioned before, in the reserved CPU and the real CPU, we have a gap. It's about 1.5. The major gap of those is because the uh, blocking, uh, blocking I.O. So IOPS in extremely large job we see is about, 40, sometimes it is about 40%, uh, even 50%, that's the extreme case. But anyway, it's a, one of the major block, bottleneck for our production. Also in this job, we have 10,000 reducers. Each reducer have tons of, um, each reducer generate one HDFS file. We will generate 10,000 files. Um, it's a, actually is an overhead for the name node. Also, we have 20,000 tasks in this uh, simple job. The scheduler also have a big overhead on the driver side. For this extremely large job, we have to tune it one by one. Especially, it, it will be very difficult if there's a data skewness. This is one of our experimental work uh, to implement a new algorithm is a secondary partitioning. Uh, I simplify the case. The left side is the regular Spark one. Um, map and reduce, both of them have six, six times six. It, the IOPS is the six, 36. The, also, the resulting file is six. On the right side, we change it to six times two. We have the six mapper, but the two reducer. But when this reducer fetching the data from upstream, we further do the secondary partitioning, split them into three sub-buckets. So the, because the local split is a continuous read and write, the IOPS actually and the uh, secondary partitioning phase is uh, negligible and comparing to the job itself. So it's about 12 IOPS. It's three times less. Also on the right side, we only have two Reduce, reducer, it generates two files. But for the task execution granularity wise, because it has three buckets, those three buckets is joined one by one. So the size is the, the right, side, right side case is the same as the right, left side, is six times six. On the reducer side, we have this big task. Each big task, we have three small tasks. On the scheduler side, it only say two reducer tasks, but on the um, execution side, we do some tricky stuff to split those major tasks to small tasks. This is the second partitioning. Also, I want to mention that when the reducer fetching the data, doing the doing the secondary partitioning, it's spilled to the disk. During this phase, we can calculate exact data size and how many records in each bucket. Instead of estimating the data size, we do accurate data size calculation. 
It has some pros and cons for this uh, secondary partitioning. First, we reduce the IOPS. If the sub bucket is a three, it reduces the size three times. If it's 10, reduce 10 times. The second one is the HDFS file. Um, reduce the HDFS, HDFS file with the same factor. Also, we do the spill, we have the accurate data size estimation. We can do the runtime optimization as well. Um, we also have the backward compatibility. If the sub bucket is number of, is one, it has the exact same behavior as the original Spark. For this job, extremely large job, we don't need to do a lot of tuning. Typically, we say 500 partition, 13 buckets is good enough to have both um, CPU usage and uh, latency. But uh, the drawback is the parallelism is reduced. It has the original one has six reducers, but now we have two reducers. Each two reducers have three tasks sequentially executed. In production, typically our workload is waiting for tasks. It's not a big issue for us. The second case uh, drawback is uh, the reducer had to fetch, fetch all the data then spill to the disk before do the computation. But for a large job, our bottleneck is IOPS. This reduced IOPS with a big factor. So in our big job, we see both the good performance, both uh, with the CPU and the latency. But for small job, we don't need this, but for extremely large job, actually, this is, uh, in practice, we see a very good optimization. With those runtime optimization steps, when we spill the data to the disk, we get the accurate data size. Then now we do the drawing. We don't based on the estimation. We based on the accurate data size. A and A join B, we know exactly a small or B small. We pick up the small side. Then we know exactly each bucket, the size of the bucket. We know whether we can use the hash join on those buckets. Then we do the hash, uh, hash join or sort mode join. This behavior is decided, determined by at the runtime instead of the compilation time. In the meantime, for the regular spark job, we decided the hash join or um, shuffle or the sort merge join on the job level. But for this case, we dis decided the join strategy on each split level. If we have one uh, table have 10 partitions, if nine partition is small, only one partition is large, those nine partitions will use the hash join. The one partition will use the sort merge join. The, yeah, this the right side is a uh, flow. Um, it's a little different uh, from the c implementation. Um, we first we pick up the table with a smaller size, then build the hash table on the smaller on the smaller side, then do the hash join. Also, we have a catch all case. If even with the accurate uh, data estimation, if it hit the auto memory issue, we still can fall back to the software join. Yeah, this is uh, some work we push to upstream. And if, by the way, for the secondary partitioning, it's uh, our experimentation work uh, still not in production yet. Yeah. Uh, I would uh, take this chance to thank um, for the big compute team and especially my intern, Lin Wang, and uh, my colleague, TGS. Uh, thanks for their contribution. Yeah. Any questions?